The Transfiguration by Sigurd Kurda. If you want to read the story in the Bible of the Transfiguration, look at Matthew 17, Mark 9, or Luke 9. This is Sigurd Kurda's interpretation of that scene. And at the top, there's the Transfiguration of Jesus. Jesus in the background, just a few lines of paint. And in the foreground is Elijah and Moses. The mountain has a dividing line and underneath are Peter, James and his brother John. Have a look at them. Their eyes are shut. They're lost in wonder, love and praise perhaps. Or perplexed, uncertain, not sure what to do. Pause for a moment. Take in the painting. Read the passage and ask, what's your initial reaction to the painting? And then we return. I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to start in heaven and then come down to earth. We begin with Jesus. Jesus is coming close to Jerusalem. His crucifixion will happen very soon. And he knew his father wanted him to go that way. And as he prayed on the mountain with three of his disciples, he changed. Earth and heaven met for a brief moment, merged together. And his face changed, his clothes became dazzling white. And in his light we see light. And here we have the light of heaven as our Lord for a moment is seen in all his transfigured glory. He's no longer the rabbi, but for a brief moment, he's back in heaven, having the most intimate, amazing experience of God. He's the son of God in all his glory and beauty. And two people appear with him in glorious splendor, Moses and Elijah. On the left is Moses, the lawgiver, the man who came down from the mountain with the law of God. He represents the law. On the right is Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, those who spoke God's word and way to humanity. Elijah represents the prophets. My take is that for months heaven's been talking about Jesus and the most exciting thing that ever would happen, the death and resurrection, and heaven just suddenly breaks open, meets together. And the discussion they have is the most important thing that will ever happen on earth. Jesus going to Jerusalem to the cross and death. Moses, the giver of the law, is there to tell Jesus he is right. Go to Jerusalem, fulfil the law. Take all the punishments for the times we've broken it. Become a curse so that the curse of the law is broken. Become the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Set my people free. Elijah, the greatest prophet, says, Go to Jerusalem, fulfill the prophecies. By your stripes we will be healed. Become despised, rejected, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom men hide their faces, despised and held in no esteem. Then the voice of God speaks through the cloud. This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And in the painting, there seems to be a circle in the background, perhaps the father encircling his son in love. Oh, beloved one, go. Go in love to do what you're meant to do. Go to die in love to redeem sinful humanity. We now return to the section of the painting beneath the line to earth. And we have the reaction of the disciples in the painting. They're not transfigured, but observers. They're watching heaven meeting earth. And the characters in the story are very different. Peter, who I think is on the right, is a down-to-earth practical northern fisherman. He's one of capable of acting without his brain. He jumped off the side of a boat, started to walk and then sank. He's a practical man. He calls a spade a spade. And his hands are clenched in this painting as if he's trying to stop himself. James and John are quite different. They are brothers and quite mystical. In the next chapter when Jesus is refused hospitality, they say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? It was those two who looked forward to sitting at the right hand of Jesus. It was those two who asked Jesus about when his coming again would be. 
They're nicknamed the Sons of Thunder by Jesus. And it was probably one of those two who had the vision of the revelation. Their hands are open in awe of what is going on above. In the Bible stories, Peter's an action man, not for him worship, contemplation, wonder and adoration. Instead, he is the practical man, the northern fisherman. Let me put up three shelters for you, he says. Perhaps he wants to make the moment last longer, Perhaps, he, but I think he just wants to do something. But indelibly marked on Peter's psyche is what happens next. He writes about it in his second letter, chapter 1. But we were eyewitnesses, he says, of his majesty. The word was heard audibly. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Return to the whole painting. In the future of eternity, we will live on a mountain top in transfigured glory. But in this life, we live in the valley. The disciples and Jesus came off the mountain. They came down to the bottom of the valley and they were immediately confronted with a boy who was having epileptic seizures. But what the disciples discovered was that God is also down in the valley and does not live only or even primarily on the mountaintop. There's a theologian, Henry Drummond, who wrote this. God does not make the mountains in order to be inhabited. God does not make the mountain tops for us to live on the mountain tops. It is not God's desire that we live on the mountain tops. We only ascend to the heights to catch a broader vision of the earthly surroundings below. We don't live there. We don't tarry there. The streams begin in the uplands and these streams descend quickly to gladden the valley below. The streams start on the mountain tops, but they come down to gladden the valleys below. And you and I live our Christian lives in the valleys of life. You and I both know what happens the next day coming down from the mountain. It's the real world, real life. After Sundays, there's always Mondays. But God is there with us in the beloved Son. And today God the Father speaks to us and points us to Jesus. You who are mystical, this is my Son, listen to him. You who are practical, this is my Son, listen to him. Moses and the law point to Jesus and say, This is the Son. Obey him. The prophets point to Jesus. This is my Son. Listen to his words of life. Follow him. This is my beloved Son, says the Father, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Amen.